and we're going to be talking about your teaching interview tips. So I know the other day I posted on Instagram, share your teaching interview questions here, and we got a lot. So I'm excited to share with you some of our for your teaching interview. We're also going to be sharing our own teaching interview stories from when. <laughs> so hi, Candace. It's hi. great to have you back. Hi. How are you? How are you? <clears throat> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How's your week been? Uh, it's been a little crazy. Um, we're, we're down here right in the midst of testing season here in Texas. So we're getting ready for all of that. And it's been um, pretty busy, but it's good. So let's get to it. We are here for some teaching interview tips. But I thought before we share some of those tips, we can talk about our own teaching interview journeys. You know, in the I know mine was in the early 2000s, but I think it's I think it's interesting to, to hear from other people who've been through it and, you know, got out on the other side. But, you know, some you may not expect like a story. So do you mind if I start with my story and then no, you can share no, yours? Go for it. Awesome. Okay. So I remember when I graduated, I had a, I had a bachelor's in special ed in elementary. I was certified in both those areas. I had a master's degree in special education as well with a concentration in augmentative and alternative communication. So I thought, you know, I'm going to get any special ed job I want, you know, and I ended up going on. So I graduated in December and I took a job at a company um, called Dynavox where I worked there uh, for for a half a year so I can get the uh, get my teaching interviews in in May and I remember going into interviews I must have been on a dozen first round interviews and after every interview just feeling so defeated I wasn't confident in my skills I wasn't able to like say what I thought was the was the way I would answer the question. I would try to answer the question the way I thought the textbook would say or what they were looking for. I didn't want to put my own spin on it because I was right. so afraid to be wrong. And <clears throat> I just I, I can just remember sitting in those long hallways next to everybody else who is there for that same position, maybe about 20 or 30 other applicants. I even went to one interview, which is a first round interview where we were in a cafeteria, maybe about three or four people to a table. And we had to do a written test before they even like brought you in for a second round. Yikes. That was the only, it was, it was super nerve wracking, but I remember like shaking. I was so yeah. nervous. I get like that too. It was, it was crazy. So first round interviews can be tough. And I think, you know, if we, if we think back to our own experiences and just that feeling of, I'm never going to get a job. Should I take this job? Is this, is, should I, should I sign my contract here? Um, well, or maybe I should wait out for that other interview. When should I contact them back? You know, if I, uh, if I went in for a second round, should I contact them back right away? I'm super excited. You know, it's all those questions, all those feelings. We've all been through it and it can be really nerve wracking for our teacher candidates and we've been through it. Yes, we have been through it. And I've, you know, I've been through a ton of interviews. I've, I've uh, gone from teaching into administration and back again. And so, uh, you know, I've done a lot. And I actually have an interview story that I learned a hard lesson from, and which is why I do a lot of what I do. When I was, um, right after my teaching, I wanted to be an administrator. So I got in, I had an interview for what's called an at-risk coordinator. And basically what it is, it's a program at a high school where um, you are, you are the coordinator of different programs for students considered to be at risk. Mm -hmm. Well, I went into this interview thinking, you know, just probably being a little overconfident not researching the position and not researching the school. And when mm. I went in, one of the questions on there was, so, um, you know, what are the 12 or 13 reasons that a student can be at risk? Well, I never studied that. Wow. So I was completely caught off guard and it was so embarrassing. And I learned the biggest lesson. Well, they were actually hiring two of those positions in that district. So from that interview, I went home. I really researched the school and, re and studied the job description so that I knew exactly what is an at-risk student, how do they qualify, 
what would my job look like? So I was prepared in the interview and mm -hmm. I got that the other position, I got that. And that was my sort of segue into administration because it's like a quasi administrative position. So I really learned the importance of researching and preparing before an interview from that one interview. And it really helped wow. with my anxiety, you know, getting nervous with my confidence. The second one, I was so much more confident because I knew what I was talking about, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I have been there. It's, it's hard interviewing and I just, I've learned so much and I have so many tips that I can just <laughs> get, if I could just give them to people, you know? <laughs> Right, right. I think it's interesting for people to see, oh, well, they've been through the interview and the process, you know, and, and they did okay, and they got a job and everything. Um, so a couple of questions that came in on that, on that um, Instagram story was, <clears throat> one was, I just got a first round interview. How long should I wait to follow up? I'm really excited about this position. And I thought I did great during the interview. Should I email a follow up like now? It's been like two days. <laughs> so when should they follow up after a first round interview? So in my opinion, I would follow up immediately. Like right after you do that first round interview, I would follow up and just say, thanks so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. I think it's never too early to follow up after a first round or even a second round. You really should do that as soon as possible, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and who should we follow up with? Should we follow so you, up with the administrative assistant, a principal, all the above? Well, one thing that you can always do is when you go into the waiting room, you want to become friends with that secretary because yes. that secretary is the person that has the principal's ear, the assistant principal's ear, and they really do a lot in that school. So you really want to befriend them, be very nice to them, and ask them questions ask them. So, hey, after this first round interview, if I want to follow up with someone, should I email the assistant principal? Should I email you or the principal? Mm -hmm. I would certainly ask them. And then I would figure out when you're in the interview room, remember, you always want to shake everybody. Well, at this point, I guess you can't, but you always want to get everybody's high five. <laughs> air high five. Yes. Get everybody's names. And then when you leave, now you'll know who to contact. Yes. Yes. I love that idea. Um, Another question that came in during the interview, this is going to be like rapid fire questions, sorry. <laughs> All right. But you are the expert. You are ready for this. So another question that came in was, after I research my schools, how do I personalize my cover letter so that it is specific to that job? Because I don't want to send a blanket cover letter out to all the, all the school districts within 30, 30 minutes of my house. But how do I really go and I really personalize it for it's for that specific opening at that specific school so you really want to find out who you are sending this cover letter to so if you're sending the cover letter to the principal you want to address the cover letter to the principal you don't want to just say to whom it may concern like to me that's <laughs> totally personal and you want to just yes. make it as personal as possible um, you also want to mention the school in the cover letter. So, you know, I would, I look forward to being able to serve the students of, you know, blank elementary or whatever. I, and you could also mention something about the school in the cover letter. I really love your character program that you guys have. And I would love mm. to be a part of that and initiate that in my morning meetings, you know, something, um, and you want to put in something specific to that school in your cover in your cover letter when you send it um you know and of course when you send the cover let the resume and cover letter i always suggest to cc that principal secretary because that person is so much more important than people think that mm -hmm, person mm -hmm. she a lot of times or he they're the ones who organize the um they're the ones who organize the meetings or the uh interviews. They're the ones who have the principal's ears. They're the ones who are going to kind of sit through some of that stuff and give their opinions. So it's super important to always CC that principal secretary when you send it to anybody. Right. Um, now, if you're going for a district 
if you're submitting this to a district and you're not quite sure of the specific, there's a lot of district pools. And if you're wanting to get your name into mm. the district, you can um, sub look up that human resources director on the district, mm -hmm. the district website and address it to that person. Great. Now I'm going to press on the topic. This wasn't one that was asked, but I, I have the question. So if you get a call from the administrative assistant saying, hey, we, we are going to do first round interviews. Can you come in? We're doing it from 8 to 10 a.m. on Wednesday. Can you come in? What if that time doesn't work for you? Are you, is it unprofessional to ask for a different time? How do you even start to um, have that conversation without sounding um, uh, maybe inconsiderate or maybe like, uh, well, that's not going to work out. Like, how do you, how do you make that sound professional? Okay, so I believe that you can say almost anything if you say it in a very kind and nice way. So when you talk to that principal secretary, if that time does not work for you, it's the way that you approach that. You know, hey, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I have a dentist appointment right at that time. Is there any other time that's available? I will make any other time work. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I was is there any way that 4 p.m. is available on that day? I, I have that time open and I would be able to make it then if at all possible. I really appreciate your help with this. You mm -hmm. know, you just, just be kind and be honest. If you've got something going on, say, I want to be there so bad, but I can't. I have this, you know, I have to take my daughter here or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Be honest with them and and you know most of the time people they're people too and they're gonna understand right. but like i said it really is in the way that you approach that and the way you talk to them and being kind being very nice being very personable you know um, yes that's kind of how you want to approach that i just wanted to ask because i think sometimes you know it can be even nerve-wracking just to ask for a different time if you don't if you don't know right. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, when, oh, go ahead. No, I mm -hmm. agree with you. It can be nerve wracking. And a lot of times, you know, I would suggest to do everything you can to be there at that time. But if it's just an absolute impossibility, then at that, you know, then do your best to sound very, very kind and apologetic in trying to change the time. But um, I do think that people are human and that if you are, being honest and telling them the reason why you can't be there, it will be okay. Right, right, 100%. So another little debate that was coming up in the questions was fancy resume versus traditional resume. Okay. So by fancy resume, I think the person is asking, should I have a picture, should I have graphics, that type of stuff, versus a Times New Roman size 12 with headers and things like that. So I know you have a lot to say about one templates and two <clears throat> fancy resumes. So go ahead. So there is a statistic out there and I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm probably right. I think it's something <laughs> like 65% of resumes get discarded because they have a picture on them because mm. people have biases that you don't realize. And so anything could be, could throw them off. Never put your own picture on a resume. Now, because times are different, like with virtual learning and, and everything that's kind of happening right now, I really feel like a very up-to-date formatted resume is important because you want to show that you're tech savvy. You know mm -hmm. how to do that stuff. It comes easy to you and natural. It's something that you do a lot. Um, just having that old style 12-point <laughs> font what? You know, no times you Roman. Times New Roman. <laughs> That's I think not it anymore. This last time, add a little jazz to it. Add some color. Yeah. Uh, you don't want it to be in cursive font or anything hard to read like that. But mm. definitely add some color to it and add <clears throat> a little of your personal flair because you do want it to stand out. Yes, you don't want it to be overwhelming on the eyes. You don't want to have a million colors. Now, blue is a very soothing color. So blue is the best color to have on your resume, a light blue color, maybe for your name or where the address bar is or something like that. But I would suggest just pick one color, add that in, um, and make it look up to date because it is important right. in our world right now. 
And there are some great templates that you can use like on Canva to make those resumes pop. And instead of using a picture of yourself, pop in a QR code that goes to your digital portfolio. That that. can also show your tech savvy skills. That is Um, a great idea. Let's talk email address, Candice. So super cutie one, two, three. Should we be using that on a professional resume? Just say it. So there's another statistic out there. And I don't know if I remember, I want to say maybe 33%. I think you're right. It Right. And it's our percent of resumes are thrown out immediately because an unprofessional email. I am an old school Hotmail <clears throat> user. I still have my Hotmail. But when I am use, doing a professional email, I have a Gmail account with my first and last name. So yes. that's what I would recommend create a Gmail account, your first and last name, um, and use that because anything unprofessional, it really, you just, like I said, people are picky and you never know what they're going to like or not like, and you don't want to give them any reason to set you aside. Right. You want to give them all the reasons to keep you in their mind for sure. Now, Candice, let's pause here before we go into some questions about specific interview questions. If someone wants to learn more and they're preparing for a teaching and preparing for their own teaching interview, now we created a course to help them out. Would you mind sharing a little bit about where we can find that information? And we'll talk more about the course at the end of our uh, chat today. So our, the course that we created is called Interview 101 Teacher Edition. Um, you can learn more about that course by going to www.theinterviewadvisor.com backslash get started also in both your bio my bio on instagram facebook tiktok anywhere you go all the things you're gonna see a link to that course Um, yes yes it is everywhere we're putting it out there everywhere awesome thank you we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes friends but let's talk about we talked about cover letters when do we follow up let's talk about that interview Um, What are two common interview questions? Now, one I'm going to ask, but because I I just want to know the answer, but I want you to think of two common interview questions and what are some good ways to answer them? So not just here are the questions, but how are we actually going to answer these things? So first is what we're going to do. What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? And do we want to have that weakness really be a a pseudo strength, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a perfectionist, and that's no. a weakness. Uh, no. <laughs> so let's yep. talk through that strength and weakness question. Probably something will be asked in a first round interview. Okay, when you're answering, <clears throat> let's just for any interview question, when you're sitting in an interview, people like to listen to stories, they're more engaged when they listen to stories. So if you're answering a question, and you're giving a bullet point list, they're more likely to tune out than if you tell a story about why that is true. So for example, if you're talking about your strength and your strength is compassion, which is a great strength to use, you can give a great story about how compassionate you are, okay? You don't wanna say, I'm compassionate, I'm energetic, I'm you know, creative. You want to give one really good one and give a story about why that's true. The weakness question, you want to show that you have self-awareness about this weakness, and you, but you also want to show that you have an action plan. One, when I am interviewing, one weakness that is a hidden supposed strength um, is perfectionism. So I, that is one of those, uh, when I hear that, I'm like, okay, they're just not wanting to share a true weakness. Um, So don't share perfectionism. One thing that I, um, you know, for me, as an example of how to answer that question, I am horrible at details. I'm not a details person, unfortunately. Um, And so I would say, you know, unfortunately, you know, I'm not a details person. However, I know that about myself. And so what I do is anytime I have a project or anything that requires very detailed work, I always make sure that I find someone who I know is detail oriented to review my work before I put it out. So I'm showing that I have self-awareness and then I'm also showing that I have an action plan to overcome that. So I do have a weakness, but Mm -hmm. I know that about myself and I know how to fix it. 
I love that. And you're giving them an action plan as to how you're working Absolutely. through working on that weakness. We all have glows and grows. We really do. Yeah. We really do. And that's okay. You know, it's okay. And you want to be honest. Like when yeah. you're talking about that stuff, you, you want to, to be human and you know, you don't want to be someone who comes across as arrogant does not go over well with interviewers mm -hmm. because you know, they, they have to work with this person. So appearing human showing that you do have a weakness, but you have a plan is always a good thing. And then what are two other common interview questions that we might be asked either first, second or third round interviews? Okay, I would say one common question would be, um, would be specific to the um, subject area that you're going to teach. So for example, you know, if you're going to do sixth grade English language arts, okay, so we one novel that we read in English language arts is, um, you know, The Giver. How would you take The Giver and um, make it more engaging for your students? I don't know. But you need to be ready for that specific subject area mm -hmm. that the curriculum within there. One thing that I suggest to do is you can go on to the most district websites or school websites will show the curriculum that they use and what they're covering. And a lot of them will put up what is called a YAG, the year at a glance. And it'll kind of <laughs> show first nine weeks, second nine weeks, third nine weeks, fourth nine weeks. You can kind of figure out what they're covering at that point so that you have an idea, especially for those second and third round interviews. You really want to know where are they in the curriculum because those are the types of questions they're going to ask you about. The other thing is another very common question that you're going to see is related to scores. Unfortunately, testing does go, um, you know, <clears throat> it goes a long way. So you're going to see a lot of those questions, you know, so um, how did a, uh, if you've reviewed our scores, you know, what is one area of weakness that we have and what do you suggest to help that? That's been an interview question that mm. a client has of mine has had. And so you have to know those demographics and the scores and how well they did. So I would say researching that school, the curriculum, the demographics, the scores that they had the year before, that's all so, so important because especially in those later round interviews, you're going to uh, most likely be asked a question about that. Right, right. Oh, that's excellent. And I would add to some of those interview questions would be uh, questions about differentiated instruction for your students. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, differentiation yeah. is huge. Yes, that's another question that you'll be asked. And, and, you know, that doesn't just relate to your special education students. It relates to your GT kids. It relates to student interest, student mm -hmm. learning styles cultural diversity. I mean, it really goes super, super far. So be ready to answer something with that um, deep of an answer. Right, right. Um, and then another question uh, would be related to classroom management. Yeah. And this one was specifically asked um, through the Instagram story, help, I, I, what if I get a classroom management question and my student teaching experience was all online? How do I even begin to answer that question during an interview? So to me, any relationship question is super easy. Any of those classroom management questions, any of the student, um, a disruptive <coughs> student, um, a, a disruptive parent or a, a rude parent, a um, classroom management issue, a student that is constantly off task, that all goes back to developing relationships at the beginning <laughs> of the year. So even if you have an online class, you're still going to develop those relationships with your student, with your students, individual, meaningful, one-on-one -on -one relationships, meaning you're yes. going to know their likes, their dislikes, learn about their families. You know, you could say something like, I'm going to write a letter to my students telling them about myself, and I'm going to have all of them write me a letter with some information about them back at the beginning of the year. I want to touch base with the parents on a positive note. Yes. So that relation, that positive relationship with them right off at, right at the beginning. Um, so you really, any of those questions, they really boil down to developing those relationships with your kiddos. 
See, I wish I knew that going into any of my yeah. interviews. Like, because mm-hmm. you think classroom management, that's such a big question. But really, what, what is it? What it's all about those relationships? It's, it's about, re- it, those are all relationships questions. Any mm-hmm. behavioral related question is relationship questions. And it all boils down to developing those relationships on a positive note at the beginning of the year. And so that's why I suggest if you, even if they say the most random question, you know, um, how would you handle a parent who is mad because of blah, blah, blah? Well, at the beginning of the year, I really strive to develop those prof- or those positive relationships with parents and I reach right. out to them with something positive so that when something like this does happen, you know, I already have a relationship with them. So it's not as difficult to call them and talk about this. Right, right. And friends, if you are liking what we're sharing tonight, this is just a little sneak peek into the course that we we created called Interview 101 Teacher Edition. You can find out more about it at the interview advisor slash, oh, dot com. Yeah, sorry, dot com. That was implied, right? Get Get started. Yeah, yeah. So you can find out more information there. We walk through the whole interview process and get you prepped from how do I even get, get a search for some schools all the way through follow up um, and follow through. So let's talk about, so we went through a couple of our interview questions. We went through cover letters and some resumes, digital portfolios. That was another thing that was asked in the Instagram stories from Monday. Um, Should we do them? Should we not? Should we bring a binder? What do we do with our portfolio to show what we know, not just tell what we know, but also show. So what are your thoughts about digital portfolios? Yay, nay? I, I really believe that any type of um, technology that you can bring and show how tech savvy you are, especially today, is always a positive thing. They may not even look at it. Um, and that's okay. But it is okay. <laughs> you, yeah, it's okay. The fact that you have it, it says so much about you that they may not feel the need to look at it. So yes, I would say definitely a portfolio, especially I had a really great interview one time and we ended up hiring this teacher because she got on to, it was a virtual interview um, and it was actually over the summer and she had her uh, digital portfolio. She attached it into the chat. She put a link to it in the chat. And then she said, you know, I would like to take a couple of minutes to go over my portfolio with you if that's okay. And she shared her screen, she showed us her portfolio, and it was super cool. And and at that time, we were like, wow, you know, we're going into remote learning. She is super savvy with tech. This Mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, And so I can't say enough about digital portfolios. Like I said, they may not look at them, but it doesn't matter. The fact that you have one says a lot about you. Right. And we've had several graduates go on to add to their portfolios that they made in college or to edit and adjust for their first year because they might need a first year teaching portfolio. So that's yeah. always been an interesting, interesting journey to, to see like, okay, I have these skills already. I don't have to worry about recreating the wheel. I can just update and add and edit and all those absolutely, things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let's finish up with, we, we've done our interview and it's between us and another candidate. What are some ways we can really stand out um, in that last round interview? What is one way that we can really stand out? In the very last round interview. So I really think it's how you end the interview. Um, you want to leave a lasting impression. And how do you do that? Well, you get people to talk about themselves because people <laughs> love to talk about themselves. So you ask the interviewer, the interviewers a story or a question about them. So, hey guys, you know, or if, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, I do. I would love to know what do you love most about working here? Yes. Or what have you learned, you know, from your time here? Um, if you could give a new teacher any piece of advice, what would it be? That's Something a great like one. To get them talking about themselves. Um, because then you're building rapport with them. They're like, oh, they're interested in me. And it's just, you know, subconscious, but you're still building rapport with that person and you're ending on a positive note. So that's what I would suggest is ask a question about the interviewer, not Mm -hmm. about yourself. Yes. Yes. So when they say, what questions do you have? Don't say nothing, Exactly. but really make that time. Like, think about that. 
Exactly. Meaningful. You don't want to waste anybody's time. I would ask maybe one or two questions, no more than that. Even one question is perfectly fine if it's a really good one. And like Mm -hmm. I said, if you're asking them to talk about themselves, they're going to love it. So that's the perfect way to end the interview. That's awesome. Now, I have one more question that came in from our stories, and then we'll finish up and talk about the course that we're offering. So one question that came in from the stories was, all right, so I had I, two round interviews, and I, and I got offered a job at one school, but I want to hold out to see if I'm offered the other job. What do I say to school A while I wait for school B to, to make their decision? How do I handle that professionally? So I've had a client put in that position before, and what, what happened was she was very honest with the first school and said, I do have another interview at this school and it's, it is closer to my house or whatever the reason was. And I would really love to be there. So I just, I would love to go on that interview, but I don't, I also don't want to um, break or hurt my chances here. So Mm -hmm. she was very honest with them about the situation And she ended up not getting the second position and going with that first one that she almost denied. So I don't, I can't tell you ultimately what the best decision is because sometimes if you say that to a school, they're going to maybe get offended because you, you're they choosing another school over them. But if you feel strong enough that you have a good chance at that second interview, be honest with the first school and see what they say. Now, if you have no idea and you're really questioning it, I don't, I would probably take that first job because you're not locked into a contract until, I mean, you're not locked into the contract until you actually sign the contract. And then that takes a couple of days, usually about 10 days. So you do Hmm. still have that little bit of time. Um, but that that really is so hard to say. I mean, it's a sticky situation. It, it is. You have to really think about, you know, do I how how well do I know? How confident do I feel with the second position for me to be honest about this first position type thing? Mm-hmm. That's a hard one. Yeah, I know. And I was like, oh, yeah, eef, I feel for you when you're in yeah, that position. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Candace, so let's talk about the um, Interview 101 Teacher Edition. We've been working on this, and we launched it this week, and we're very, very excited about it because it helps teacher candidates who are just in this this stage in life where they're interviewing for for new positions, where they're interviewing for a first uh, position, a first teaching position. So we walk through, how do I even look to find a job? How do I customize that resume and that cover letter? What is a first round interview? What am I going to be asked? What do I wear? How do I prep? Um, And then we even go into how to follow up like a pro. Um, You know, we talk about virtual interview tips as well, in-person interview tips, Um, how body language affects affects your interview. Yeah. And I, I know for me, one of my favorite parts of parts of the of the course was thinking about the cover letter customization, and then also prep the night before because that'll help with some anxiety. It'll help with some stress in the morning if you pick out your outfit the night before, if you make sure everything's clean and ready to go, but you have your any accessories that you want to wear, you have your um, computer or your laptop or your phone charged up so you can show your digital portfolio that you get enough sleep. And that was one of my favorite parts to prep for the course. What was one of your favorite parts about the course to create? Um, to create it, I really love talking about the different interview questions that you might face and ways that you can answer those because I do know, you know, I, I interviewed for several schools right out of student teaching, but I've had several clients who have not had any student teaching and they're coming out of an alternative Mm. education and going right into teaching without that classroom experience. And so it's, how do I base my my, where do I base my answers from? I have no classroom experience. And so I was really trying to be conscious of that when I was answering those questions and helping you to think, or 
really giving you suggestions and ideas on how to answer those questions if you've never actually been in the classroom. And mm -hmm. a lot of those questions really do boil down to, to behavior and building relationships. So I talk about that a lot. Um, so that was probably my favorite part. It's just interesting to me, the, the, psych the psychology of it and, you know, diving into those questions. And we go through a lot and it's, it's really the most common interview questions you will face as a teacher and how to answer those questions. Yes, because getting a list of those questions is one thing, but how do I even how go into answer a, to answer them? That's mm -hmm. a totally another story, yes. yes. So we would love to open up to questions from all of you joining us tonight. If you're interested in learning more about the course, head on over to the interview advisor slash get started. That's also the links in our bios. Um, yep. And we have a little freebie in each of our bios as well that have tips for applying for a job, walking through a couple of, you know, thinking about your why, thinking about your uh, 30 second pitch um, and some resume hacks as well in that freebie. If you are interested, head on over to the link in our bio and you will find more information, but we would love to open up to questions from you all. If you have any questions, just drop them in our chat and we will be sure to uh, get them answered. Awesome. One thing this I love to talk about, yeah, it is, it's, I love talking about it. Um, and we mentioned this last time, but it's the list of acronym, the education acronyms. Yes. And I just saw another meme about that today, about how educators <laughs> have their own language. And it's so we do. true. And we really decipher that language for you. We yes. have the, 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 the acronym, what it stands for, and also that darn definition that you need yes. to know what it, it's talking about. So right. that is included in the course, and um, it's pretty helpful. I wish I would have had one of those when I first started interviewing, for sure. Yes. I just have to go back to those interview questions because, you know, you can Google like common teaching interview questions and you're going to get a whole bunch of bullet pointed lists and things like that. But tips on how to answer them. I think that's where the power is in the course where, you know, hey, here's some strategies to get to the answer to this question. And just that little tip that you shared when it comes to classroom management and behavior, Sam, it's all about relationships. And it's like, Oh, yeah, I did know that. But, you know, when you're asked, how would, what, what's your classroom management strategy? Uh, class I dojo? And I put my rules in. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, that's what you, you, you go to is rules and procedures. But really, um, classroom management boils down to, you know, are, they're going to they're gonna work for you if they love you. They're, if yeah. they respect you, they're going to, you know, so you it's really a have to street. show them. Yeah, you have to show them that you care about them for them to, to respond. Yes, yes. All right, friends. So we're not seeing any questions in the chat, and that's okay. Maybe you're a little shy. That is fine. You can to totally hit us up in DMs, and we'll be happy to work with you, answer any questions. And one more time for the people who just joined us, you can learn more about our course over at theinterviewadvisor.com slash get started. The link is in our bio and we look forward to working with each of you and we wish you the best of luck during teaching interview season. Absolutely. <laughs> look forward to hearing from any of you. Please, please reach out if you have any questions. Really happy to answer them. Yes. Thank you so much, Candice, and I'll see you soon. Awesome. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye.